80-year-old man comes in with crescendo, decrescendo, systolic murmur that increases with expiration. He has a history of chest pain and SOB. What's SOB? Shortness of breath. You guys are paying attention. Now he presents after passing out. His murmur is heard best at the right second intercostal space. Everybody, even on your USMLE guys, start pointing at yourself. Start pointing at yourself. Your body is the best learning tool. Okay? So, murmur heard at the right second intercostal space with radiation to the carotids. What feature may correlate to increase severity of this murmur? What feature? So guys, this is aortic stenosis, right? Aortic stenosis on your USMLE, three things that they're gonna say. Syncope, I passed out, angina, oh. okay, and SOB, shortness of breath. Syncope, angina, and dyspnea. That's really sad, syncope, angina, and dyspnea, right? So what's gonna be a feature that may correlate to the severity of this murmur? Well, a longer and later peak of the murmur, that's going to be more severe because you're going to have to really force that blood through the aortic, um, uh, the aortic uh, stenosis um, uh, lesion. The intensity of the murmur also relates to the left ventricle to aorta gradient, okay? So when you have a longer and later peak, that's going to be a more severe murmur. What is the likely pathology causing this murmur? The likely pathology causing this murmur in this 80-year-old guy, it's calcific stenosis with aortic leaflet thickening. You know how you can summarize this into? You can say wear and tear. It's wear and tear. In this old guy, it's wear and tear. However, USMLE will give you this question. What if the patient was a middle-aged male with aortic stenosis? What would be the likely etiology? Middle-aged male now. If you're a middle-aged male, you're not thinking, oh yeah, wear and tear, right? My dad's about middle age. I'm not saying wear and tear, right? I'm saying bicuspid aortic valve. Whenever you see bicuspid aortic valve, you want to think of early onset aortic stenosis. That's huge. Now, don't leave the pulmonary side out, so let's talk about this question. Patient presents with flushing, cramping, and nausea. He has a systolic murmur heard best at the second left intercostal space. Start pointing, guys. Echocardiogram shows diastolic dysfunction. A systemic pathology is suspected. So when you have this kind of diastolic dysfunction and you have structural changes in the heart, okay, what can happen is, is that you can have this syndrome that is called what? Carcinoid syndrome, right? And the key features of carcinoid syndrome are the first couple, sent, uh, couple words of this, of this uh, uh, vignette. And remember, when that serotonin load is going to hit the right side of the heart, it can cause damage to the right-sided valves, either the pulmonary valve or the tricuspid valve, okay? So pulmonic stenosis could be caused by this kind of vignette in which you have a carcinoid tumor that starts in the small bowel. Remember, carcinoid tumor starting in the small bowel then has to migrate to what in order to be called carcinoid syndrome? To the liver, beautiful. Has to start in the small bowel, then you migrate to the liver, then it's carcinoid syndrome, then it can wreak havoc. So the USMLE point is pulmonary stenosis or tricuspid regurgitation caused by carcinoid syndrome can lead to core pulmonale, and core pulmonale is right-sided heart failure. Carcinoid syndrome results when a carcinoid tumor migrates from the small intestine to the liver, and this creates these systemic symptoms, including right-sided fibroelastic heart changes. And what's the reason? Why is it right side? It's because monoamine oxidase is found in the pulmonary vasculature. Just like angiotensin converting enzyme, MAO is found in the pulmonary vasculature, and it inactivates these active metabolites. And that's why you get right-sided lesions rather than left-sided lesions. Aortic regurgitation. A 38-year-old man comes in with one week shortness of breath with exertion. On physical exam, light palpation of the carotid artery shows upstroke that is abnormally brisk and downstroke that falls pre precipitously. You know what this is paraphrased to, guys? Widen pulse pressures. Widen pulse pressures. A murmur is heard as well. What is the likely reason behind this murmur, or what is the likely murmur? That is aortic regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation, guys, is aortic regurgitation systolic or diastolic murmur? Yeah, exactly. Aortic regurgitation is a diastolic murmur. Aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation, those are your systolic murmurs. Aortic regurgitation and, yep, mitral stenosis, those are going to be your diastolic murmurs, okay? So remember, aortic regurgitation, you have this head bobbing, 
and widened pulse pressures. And this is the physical exam finding behind the widened pulse pressures. So it's a high pitch, blowing, early diastolic decrescendo murmur, and you have a hyperdynamic pulse with a wide pulse pressure. Mitral stenosis, systolic or diastolic? Diastolic murmur. Mitral stenosis is going to be a diastolic murmur. Get that in your mind, okay? So a patient with severe diastolic murmur heard at the apex with an opening snap presents with shortness of breath. Trivial tricuspid regurgitation is appreciated on an echo. What would be the status of the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure during this time? What is it? Increased, exactly. Why? Mitral stenosis. Remember, it's a stenonic valve. <laughs> the left atrium is trying to push so hard against that. And then if the left atrium can't really do that, it's going to back up into the pulmonary, and the pulmonary pressure is going to be high. So increased pulmonary and capillary wedge pressure as patients with severe mitral stenosis causes backup of the plasma and pulmonary hypertension. We say, oh my gosh, mitral, you get all of the action when it comes to heart, right? Let's talk a little bit about tricuspid, right? This is a good point for me to tie in, is that when, when you say increase in sound during inspiration, remember, right-sided murmurs, they increase in intensity with inspiration. Left-sided murmurs, they are going to increase in intensity with <sighs> expiration. So it increases with inspiration, and what is the likely murmur here? Tricuspid stenosis, okay? That's the title of the slide, guys, all right? Patent ductus arteriosus. A newborn presents with a murmur heard in both systole and diastole. That's the way they say continuous. Systole and diastole in the infraclavicular region. Go ahead and point. The patient has normal pulses and warm, well-perfused extremities. What is the likely embryological origin of this lesion? Embryological origin of this lesion is going to be the sixth aortic arch. Okay. Remember, the sixth aortic arch, that Sixth aortic arch is going to be the, rem the sixth aortic arch remnant is the ductus arteriosus, which connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta, and that's the function of the ductus arteriosus. So, patent ductus arteriosus, they usually close within the first 15 hours of life. However, you can get the continuous machinery like murmur if you have um, it within that period or a little bit after that period. So, what infectious etiology is related to a PDA? Yeah, exactly. Rubella. Congenital rubella is related to a PDA. See how, see how we're tying all of this stuff in? We just hit up a little bit of microbiology just by talking about PDA. What medication can close the PDA? Yeah, endomethacin. Remember, PGE2 keeps the ductus arteriosus open. However, if you give an NSAID like endomethacin affecting the prostaglandin pathway, you will close the ductus arteriosus.